I first want to welcome you all for coming uh, to the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity at Trinity International University. And I want to thank the coordinating committee who helped put this event together. First of all, my name is Mark Bradford. I'm the president of the Jerome Lejeune Foundation. Uh, we also had on our committee Dr. David Prentice, representing the Family Research Council, who is also our first speaker this morning. John Russell from Medical Students for Life. And a tremendous thank you to Mike Sleesman and Jennifer McVeigh here at the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity for the role that they played as well, and for offering us this wonderful space and the live streaming capabilities. Thank you too to Glory Dias for managing all the technology that makes this day possible. Each of us will talk a little bit about our organizations as we move through the day. Uh, just a couple of things first, though, with regard to housekeeping. John Russell and the Medical Students for Life are offering lunch to the participants at this conference. So he has a little sheet, I think, that he'll be passing out, okay, that, that will tell you where that lunch is happening. And uh, we also have uh, CME credits for those who are uh, obtaining continuing medical education credit for today's event. The last opportunity to register for those credits will be lunchtime. <coughs> so if you have not registered for CMEs and you're wanting to obtain CMEs for this event, Sorry for those of you who are out in the virtual world, you're not eligible. Uh, but those of you who are here and present in the room, you can obtain CME credit by registering uh, no later than lunch. And of course, the usual process of evaluations and checking in and, and verifying that you're here apply. If you're not a, a medical doctor, you need a certificate of completion for your institution. Uh, verifying that you were here today, we can also provide that to you through the day. So. Um, just ask at the table out front, and we should be able to take care of all of those things for you. Since I'm starting, I will just mention a little bit about the Jerome Lejeune Foundation at the beginning of the day. There's some information on the back table, if you would like it. There's a trifold brochure that explains the mission of the Jerome Lejeune Foundation. Uh, there's a small little pamphlet called The 21 Thoughts of Jerome Lejeune, which is a, a highly compressed version of some of the writings or words that he spoke at some point during his life. And then we've just published in English our little student's guide to bioethics. This was originally published in France in 2008, I believe it was, in response to some of the uh, uh, misunderstandings, I suppose you could say, that were being promoted in schools regarding the life issues in France. And it's become a hugely popular document. It's free of charge. The Foundation in Paris has given 300,000 of them or more away at this point. Uh, the document is now published in English. It's currently being translated in Romanian, Hungarian, Swedish, Italian, Swahili. So it's catching on around the world. I would encourage you to take a copy. I have a few more copies in my bag if there are no longer any at the back table. Or you can contact me if you would like at the Jerome Lejeune Foundation and we can send copies to you. Again, they're free of charge. Uh, we just want them in high school students' hands. We're distributing two million of them at World Youth Day in Rio de Janeiro, uh, which has already begun now and through next week in four languages. And uh, so there will be young people who are attending the World Youth Day in Rio de Janeiro next week who will be going home to their countries with a copy of this in hand. So we're hoping to do follow up with that as well and to continue to form the up and coming culture into a culture of life. So young people have a clear understanding of the bioethical issues that affect their everyday lives at this point. So everyone probably knows or has at least heard of Jerome Lejeune. But Jerome Lejeune was the French geneticist that discovered the cause of Down syndrome in 1958. He discovered that Down syndrome was caused by an extra copy of the 21st chromosome. If you were looking at the news yesterday, you might have seen that really there's no longer a need to have this conference because scientists have found a way to silence the 21st, the extra copy of the 21st chromosome, if it were only that simple. It's encouraging news to see that research has come that far, but it's far from really answering the question of the mechanisms of trisomy 21 or Down syndrome, which are com incredibly complex. But Jerome Lejeune, when he made his discovery in 1958, realized he had identified two targets. He had identified a target for researchers to investigate therapeutic treatments to improve the lives of individuals with Down syndrome. But he also realized, since amniocentesis had just been used a couple of years before to identify an X-linked chromosomal disorder, that he had also identified a target for people who would seek out uh, individuals prenatally who carry an extra copy of the 21st chromosome or who have Down syndrome. And we know what the conclusion of that has been. In France, the abortion rate for Down syndrome is 96%. 
in the United States. We're not quite certain because we don't keep accurate statistics, but the latest study said the weighted mean nationally is 67%, with some regions of the country and in some groups higher, and some regions of the country and some subgroups lower. So whatever the number, I think we can all agree that anyone who is, is trying to identify an individual with a 21st chromosome or any extra chromosome or any genetic condition, for that matter, that can be identified prenatally for the purpose of, of, uh, of removing those people from our population is a, is, a, is a fairly significant and difficult social problem that we have to conquer. So Jerome Lejeune spent his life trying to find therapeutic treatments to improve the lives of individuals with Down syndrome and other genetic intellectual disabilities. He was a medical doctor and continued his practice of care for them and he was a strong advocate on behalf of the disabled. When he died in 1994, he regretted that his work hadn't been completed, and so his family went to work on establishing a foundation to continue his work, and the Jerome Lejeune Foundation then became an official public charity in France in 1996, and has grown to be the world's largest private funder for research into genetic intellectual disabilities. Last fiscal year, we contributed $5 million to research uh, the equivalent of $5 million to research into not just Down syndrome, but all genetic intellectual disabilities. At least half of our budget for Down syndrome. We're funding two clinical trials currently, our own at our institute in Paris. Uh, we have a medical institute in Paris and also a study in Barcelona. Um, our funding budget is about 25% of what the federal government's funding for Down syndrome research is. So that gives you an idea of the substance and the weight of the Jerome Lejeune Foundation. Uh, we already have relationships with several researchers in the United States, and so the family and those that run the foundation in Paris decided that they wanted to bring the foundation's present more substantially to the United States. And so uh, just July 1st of last year, we officially launched the, or opened the office, I should say, of the Jean Lejeune USA Foundation. So we're working here to continue the mission that is so well established in Paris and to bring it more substantially to the U.S. So that's just a little bit about the Jerome Lejeune Foundation, but it really points to what the objective of today's conference is. And today's conference is to delve in more deeply to this topic of prenatal diagnosis, which is such a critical topic to address. Now, I was doing a little research a week or so ago and came across a university who's offering a very advanced microarray analysis for women who are pregnant in which they claim to be able to identify 150 uh, genetic abnormalities. Uh, we're talking about Down syndrome, chromosome 21, the third copy of chromosome 21, fairly easy to identify in traditional methods of, of diagnosis and screening. But now with the, with the uh, presence of the non-invasive prenatal testing, non-invasive prenatal screening that's available, we realize that the ante has been upped on the ability of physicians to offer testing to women that can help them identify what they claim almost 100% accuracy in high-risk populations, the presence of an extra 21st chromosome. And knowing what the trajectory has been over the years of identification and termination of individuals with genetic uh, intellectual disabilities, mm -hmm. I think we can see what the future may bring here unless we're able to do something very substantial to turn that course around. So the purpose of today's conference is to equip those of you who work in the medical professions those of you who counsel individuals, families of individuals, and friends of individuals who might have a prenatal diagnosis or who, or, who, or who are living through a decision of what to do in the wake of a prenatal diagnosis. We want you to have good tools and a good understanding of, of, uh, of, of how to address that. So that's the, ob that's the objective of today's conference. We have five wonderful speakers. We have had to make a substitution for our last speaker of the day. Dr. John Thorpe, at the last moment, was unable to attend his brother was killed in an automobile accident, and so he had to be home with his family. So we certainly want to keep Dr. Thorpe in our thoughts and in our prayers and his family, and, but we have tremendous thanks to Donna Harrison, who uh, is the executive director of, the, of APLOG, who's here with us today, who came in to substitute for him at the last moment.